Happy Wednesday, everyone, and welcome back to Sports Scene. I'm Ava Brand. I'm Adam Bradford. I'm Andrew Brooks. And I'm Karn Rostogi. It was a wild weekend of college football shaking up the AP Top 25. Georgia reclaims the throne, Alabama falls to number three, and UCLA rises seven spots. USC, though, now sits at number seven despite its win against Washington State. Tennessee passed the Trojans with a convincing 40-13 win against LSU. It's shaping up to be another wild weekend with a host of good matchups. Alabama at Tennessee, uh, Michigan versus Oklahoma, or sorry, Michigan versus Penn State, Oklahoma State at TCU. What do you guys think is going to happen this weekend? I think that the Alabama-Tennessee game is fascinating. I think that both those teams are going to be in contention for a uh, college football playoff bid. They're both ranked in the top six, and it's the top four teams that make it at the end of the year. I think the matchup's going to come down to the health of Alabama's quarterback, Bryce Young. Uh, he injured his shoulder a couple weeks ago, and I think that if he plays, Alabama will beat Tennessee, but if he doesn't, I do not like their chances. Um, I think the game I'm looking at is the Big 12 matchup. Um, Oklahoma State TCU could, uh, could decide the face and how the Big 12 looks for the rest of the year. Um, TCU obviously picked up a big win last week against Kansas in Lawrenceville. Um, and Oklahoma State is a team that looks really good. I like their quarterback. I like how they play. I like Mike Gundy. Um, and I just really think that I think Max Duggan and that TCU offense might overwhelm uh, Oklahoma State and their team. Yeah, those are two really good games. Another game we're looking forward to is Penn State, Michigan. Uh, it's a big shot in the Big Ten. Uh, Ohio State seems to be the best team in the Big Ten, according to most people, but Penn State and Michigan, neither of them's lost a game yet either. So which, wh whoever wins that game has got the inside trap to sort of challenge Ohio State for the Big Ten crown. And you mentioned Tennessee, Alabama. That should be a crazy game for sure. Uh, Tennessee hasn't beaten Alabama in 15 years, since 2006. So you can bet th this is definitely their best chance they've had in a long time. So you can bet the scene in Knoxville is going to be crazy. So uh, I, after seeing what happened in the Ole Miss-Tennessee game last year, things could get ugly either for better or for worse depending on what happens in the game but should be a fascinating scene for sure i mean every conference we got the sec big 10 big 12 like pac 12 too there's a big game yeah. uh acc i think there's a big i think syracuse is uh syracuse is undefeated syracuse in the acc NC so NC yeah only got one yeah we got each other we too, got so. wild games in every conference everyone's got someone to root for someone to watch yep all right, well, moving on to USC. On Saturday at the Coliseum, Lincoln Riley and the Trojans took down Washington State by a final score of 30-14. to With the win, USC improved to 6-0 for the first time since 2006. That year, the Trojans won 11-2 with a conference title and a Rose Bowl win over Michigan. In addition, Riley became the first USC head coach to start his tenure with six straight wins since Jess Hill in 1951. Although the toughest games on the schedule are still in front of them, the 7th ranked Trojans are currently on the inside track to reach the Pac-12 championship game in Las Vegas on December 2nd. Andrew, why don't you take us through the offensive performance behind USC's win on Saturday? Thanks, Adam. Even without the eye-popping highlights and numbers of the previous games, USC's offense stayed on course and powered their way past the Cougars. The Trojans put up only 188 yards through the air, down from their average of 256 on the season. Star wide receiver Jordan Addison only totaled 30 yards, so it was running back Travis Dye that kept the offense chugging. He accumulated nearly 170 yards with angry runs that carved up the Washington State defense. The passing game had its hiccups, but the resiliency of this Trojans team was shown by Mario Williams, who had a bad drop early in the game, but bounced back for 82 yards and two scores to help the Trojans fight back from their first home deficit of the season. Caleb Williams doesn't look like himself through this, this week, through the season. He only completed less than 50% of his passes, and the offensive line pass blocking looks like it's been regressing since conference plays begun a couple weeks ago. What do the Trojans need to do to fix their passing attack before the upcoming showdown with Utah this week? I mean, I think a big thing is just holding each other accountable. I think we saw Travis Dye a couple weeks ago say that this team is just not performing as well as they should and could be. Uh, and we saw him step up, and now it's time for the rest of the offense to step up, the offensive line, the passing game, the receivers. We saw Myra Williams, you know, like step up when teams are kind of they're starting to figure out how USC and Lincoln Riley is using Jordan Addison 
And so they're going to need uh, other receivers to step up in place when Addison is getting – if he's going to get locked down, you need to have their secondary receivers step up and make plays. Yeah, for sure. You talk about getting locked down. Addison obviously this week is going up against Clark Phillips from Utah. who's one of the best cornerbacks in the country. So individually, that should be a really exciting matchup to watch. And also the offensive line. I think the healthy offensive line is really key. Bobby Hassan has been dealing with some injuries this year. So if USC is to get into their sixth, seventh, eighth offensive lineman, they could be in trouble because Utah is a team that's always they've never had like superstar skill position plays, but they've always had very strong fronts, offensive line, defensive line. So if USC is banged up on the offensive line, the Utah defensive front could cause a lot of trouble for Caleb Williams. Uh, we can talk all we want about X's and O's, and I know, but I know that Lincoln Riley and I know that the rest of this staff will hopefully make the right adjustments. They'll make the tactical stuff. What I need to look at, what I think the team needs to really, really stay in, stay in with, is their communication. We saw against Oregon State, there were a lot of miscommunications, a lot of times where we got late in the clock, the pa- uh, the play mm-hmm. clock, and a lot of timeouts that. Um, we shouldn't have had to take. This is going to be a heated stadium. It's a blackout game, Rice Echo Stadium. They're going to be mad. They're going to be yelling at us the whole time. They're going to be yelling at the team. And so I think what they need to work on and they need to make sure is okay is their communication. How are your audibles going to work? How are your plays going to get through? I think that is the most important thing, and that could see USC win this game. Well, you mentioned the offense. Uh, communicating on the offense. Let's see what Lincoln Riley has to say about the offense. We missed a couple of throws uh, and we dropped some balls. I mean, when you throw it 30 times and, you know, you, you take really, I mean, you take really 10 of those off the board that were either, a, you know, a missed throw or a drop pass. I mean, they are pretty good on the rest of them. There's just not a whole lot left. We were totally controllable on our end. Um, Missing things that we would expect to uh, expect to finish, and uh, but we're able to make it up in other areas. Let's move to the defensive side of the ball, though. The wa- the unit held Washington State to under 320 total yards and to 14 points with an impressive performance from Tuli Tuipolotu. The defense is now number one in the Pac-12 in scoring this year, thanks to big performances from a handful of players. Defensive lineman Tuili Tuipolotu leads the nation in sacks with seven after recording three against Washington State. Linebacker Eric Gentry has been all over the field, using his 7-1 wingspan to tip passes and wreak havoc for opposing quarterbacks. Makai Blackman has emerged as a true number one corner with Kalen Bullock alongside him to shut down opposing receivers. After Tuli's monster performance against the Cougars, earning him Pac-12 Defensive Players of the Week, how can he keep that energy up this weekend and throughout the rest of the season? Yeah, I think that's going to be important. They definitely, USC is definitely going to need a big game from Tui Tui Pelotu, obviously the defensive front. And I think Eric Gentry is another key player. Last year, USC's defensive front against Utah was an absolute disaster. The Utes ran the ball all, all over USC. It was like the parting of the Red Sea almost. <laughs> so yeah, if USC wants to have a chance against Utah, they definitely need guys like Tui, uh, Eric Gentry, Shane Lee. I don't know if he's going to play. He didn't play last week. If not, Will and Goforth definitely need to step up more. He stepped up well last week. But yeah, USC's front seven is going to be key. Because if Utah runs the ball against USC like they did last year, it could get ugly. Yeah, I mean, uh, speaking about Tuli, speaking about the rest of that team, the way you get these defensive performances and the way you get these players to play well is to continue to wreak havoc, continue to confuse the quarterback, continue to run stunts in different ways to get your edge rushers on 1v1s with running backs, with tight ends, and with the rest of that team. I think when you create the more pressure, we're going to create more turnovers. We're going to make them open the field up. And when they open the field up, we have great athletic players in the secondary and in the linebacking core that can help punish that Utah team. Yeah, the biggest weakness of USC's entire team is the run defense. Watching them on defense, they get sacks, they get interceptions, they force fumbles, and there's really never any big passing plays that USC's defense gives up, but the run defense just gives up chunk plays and chunk plays. Uh, Washington State's running back this weekend, Jenkins, had 13 carries for 130 yards against the Trojans. On the season, he had 24 carries for only 123 yards before that. So USC gave up more yards to him than the rest of the teams had the entire season. So stopping that run defense, and most of the big plays are on outside runs, 
it must be some kind of scheme that uh, USC can't quite figure out how to tackle on those outside runs, but that's got to be the key because Utah has a powerful running game led by Cam Rising on, uh, as their quarterback, which is quarterbacks when they scramble is to the outside. So I'm worried about long runs that uh, could be uh, g gained by Utah. But I think I, it's certainly something to worry about right now. But I think as we've seen through the first half of the season, this defense will make adjustments. I mean, everyone was calling it the Achilles heel of this USC team heading into the season. But Alex Grinch has really flipped the script. Um, I mean, the defense leads the nation. It's the number one. It has 12 interceptions, leads the nation, 24 sacks. Uh, it's just Alex Grinch is really refining that whole defense and working through those schemes. So, yes, it's a concern right now, but I think he will get it fixed for the in the future. Um, this weekend will be a big test, you know, like the loud stadium and everything, but it certainly is not – it's a dark spot right now for the Trojans, but I have confidence that they will be able to turn it around. Yeah, and you definitely mentioned turnovers. That's always the biggest question is, is that sustainable? Because usually when a team winning the turnover margin by a lot, that's not sustainable for the long term. I mean, USC seems doing pretty well with it right now. I think Caleb Williams has thrown one interception all year, and USC's recorded like 15 or 14 turnovers. They're leading the nation in turnover margin. So can they continue to carry that over? I mean, obviously in a loud stadium, that's going to affect the offense far more than the defense, but if USC can continue to not turn the ball over and create takeaways, they have a good shot to beat Utah. If they can't carry that up, it's going to be a very tough game. Definitely, and I think in the past two games, you've seen the defense kind of help win the game for the offense. Yeah. It's not like they're relying on the offense anymore. I mean, this was a defensive battle against Washington State, against Arizona State. That defense set the tone in the second half, and when you look back all the way to Oregon State, the defense pretty much won that game, too, for USC. So, I don't think it's as big of a weakness as everyone is making it out to be. Yeah, um... It's definitely, it's definitely a concern, and it's definitely something we're going to have to look forward to. But in other Pac-12 news, um, an undefeated UCLA team and a one-loss Utah team faced off in the Rose Bowl last Saturday. In what was a shootout played by two high-quality football teams, the UCLA Bruins took home a 42-32 victory. UCLA quarterback Dorian Thompson Robinson advanced his Heisman campaign, throwing for 299 passing yards and four touchdowns. DTR also punched one in. DCR also punched one in for one more touchdown in for himself. Running back Zach Charbonnet ran for 198 yards on 22 attempts and one touchdown. Though Utah quarterback Cam Rising did not throw for a touchdown during this game, he threw for 288 yards and picked up two touchdowns on the ground. Utah running back Tavion Thomas also ran for 98 yards on 19 attempts. And Utah's leading receiver was Devon Valle, who caught six passes for 87 yards. UCLA struck first and did not give up the lead for the rest of the game. Both teams had over 475 total yards in what was a great game for fans. So obviously both teams are talented and both teams are going to give USC a tough game. But which team is going to give them the tougher game? I personally think it's UCLA. Before the season, Utah was ranked in the top 10 and UCLA wasn't ranked anywhere near um, where they are now, which is just outside the top 10. But the way that USCLA has played this season is just incredible Be behind Dorian Thompson-Robinson. Dorian Thompson-Robinson and Caleb Williams' matchup against each other later in the year might be the most anticipated quarterback matchup of the season because of how electric both of those players are at passing the ball and running the ball. And I cannot wait for that game. Utah was supposed to be a... a contender for the college football playoff but sitting at four and two with some more tough games this season i'm not sure how uh how much in the national conversation they are anymore yeah but you bring up the rankings before the season but the rankings before the season don't matter when we've seen these teams play now ucla is six and zero. Oh. yes that will be a tough game but i think utah is still the tougher game i mean lincoln riley quarterback whisperer tried to recruit cam rising to oklahoma back in the day so he clearly has very high praise for the quarterback, and it will be a loud stadium, um, an experienced quarterback, too. Both of the quarterbacks have experience, but traveling to the Rose Bowl versus traveling to a different state in Rice-Eccles, I think those Utah fans will show out in numbers and show out crazier, and we can't start thinking about UCLA. Or U USC cannot start thinking about playing UCLA until they handle business at Utah because if UCLA, USC loses to Utah, then it's UCLA's conference at that point. 
Yeah, of course not. And also, you mentioned uh, Rice Eccles Stadium being a tough place to play. That stadium's going to be packed. UCLA had their biggest home game in years on Saturday, and the Rose Bowl was less than half full. So with all due respect, playing at Rice Eccles and playing a road game at the Rose Bowl, which is actually close to the USC's campus and UCLA's, you know, there's going to be a lot of USC fans there. It's not the same. When you look at the games where Caleb Williams struggled in his career, what do they all have in common? Baylor last year, Oregon State this year, Oklahoma State last year. They've all been on the roads in front of hostile crowds. So I think that hostile crowd, you remember, Caleb Williams is still a sophomore. He's only 19 years old. So that hostile crowd could get in Caleb Williams' head a bit. I think Utah could be a struggle because of that. I don't I don't think the UCLA crowd is going to do that to him. All uh, of us I can't wait for the Utah game this weekend, but now it is time to look at some other USC sports. Um, the women's volleyball team this weekend took a road trip to Arizona and defeated both Pac-12 foes they faced. The wins over the Wildcats and the Sun Devils improves the women of Troy's record to 5-1 and one in conference and 13-4 and four overall. Against Arizona, it was a hard-fought victory for USC, who emerged victorious three sets to one, despite all three wins featuring the exact same score of 25 to 20. The Wildcats didn't make it easy for the Trojans, but Skylar Fields ultimately proved too much to handle. With 22 kills and 13 digs, she helped will the Trojans to victory. Two days later, the team started off slowly against Arizona State, losing the first set. But once again, it was Fields who dominated to lead the Trojans to three straight set wins and an overall her 27 kills combined with 45 assists from Mia Twaniga. This overwhelmed the Sun Devils. Coming up this Friday, USC will have one of its toughest matchups of the season, hosting 17th ranked Oregon. Skylar Fields has over 300 kills this season and no player in the Pac-12 has more than 250. What does a player like this mean for the program and for USC's chances nationally? Um, I think Skylar Fields, I mean, she's incredible. Um, she won uh, National Player of the Week this week, and she leads the Pac-12 in kills, kills per set, all those kind of stats. And what it really, really means is that as a program, you need to game plan against her. You need to say, okay, I need to dodge her. I can't let her have the ball. I need to hit strategically so that she can't go for kills and I think USC is 13 13 and 0 this year when they have a higher hitting percentage than their opponent and I think Skylar Fields is obviously an incredible reason why um, why that is that you mentioned uh, having a game plan against Skylar Fields which paves the way obviously for more or other players to step up and I think we did see that this weekend against uh, Arizona State Caitlin Smith had nine kills her previous career high was two I mean, that's what, three, th three times as much? Whoa, sorry, math is a little hard for me sometimes. Uh, f I think more than four. Yeah. More than four times. Oh, yeah. Okay. What, that, that's beside the Clearly, point. it's very hard for yeah. me. Uh, but but she had no errors, so that's an easy zero, a good zero. Uh, so we're really seeing other players step up um, with Skylar Fields paving the way, which is huge, and setting the precedent and the confidence in this team. Yeah, definitely, and it's great to see other players step up. I mean, you mentioned, like, Skylar Fields. Like, that's a program-changing player. Like, when you have one player who can single-handedly take over a game like that and will your team to victory, like, that's just huge for a program. Because you see they start off the season a little bit shaky, but they've come on stronger with the guys of players like those. So, I mean, that's also a great tool in recruiting for building the future. You say, like, you want to come here, you can be the next Skylar Fields and help will this program to national championships. Yeah, it's, like, impossible to describe what players like that can do for a program. Yeah, it'll be, uh, you know, women's soccer also faced the Arizona schools, coming off a 2-1 to victory against Arizona State Sunday. But the weekend was not a complete su success for the team. Arizona shut out USC on Thursday. It was the first time the team went scoreless since August. The Trojans welcomed the Arizona schools looking to continue the rise in the top 25, but missed opportunities was the theme against the Wildcats. USC had 15 shots and nothing to show for it. Corey Bethune gets a chance from the penalty spot, but is unable to convert. A chip of Anna Smith and goal just two minutes later puts the Wildcats ahead and the Trojans away for good. But just like Little Caesars Pizza, the Trojans came out hot and ready against the Sun Devils. Bethune with a quick start off a of foul and easily gets by the Arizona State defense. She continues the charge with a rocket from the box six minutes later to put the USC up 2-0. to zero. Arizona State catches USC's defense sleeping to start the second half, but the Trojans hold off the comeback and win 2-1. to one. So 1-1 one one last weekend drops the Trojans 10 spots from number 8 nationally to number 18. What does this team have to do 
this weekend against Cal and the rest of the season to solidify themselves as a top 25 program? Well, USC wait. is still most definitely a top 25 program. Um, they have scored 23 goals so far in their 11 game season and only allowed 10. So pretty much averaging a two to one uh, goal differential in every game. And they were coming off uh, an eight straight game sequence of either winning or tying without that loss. The 10 spot loss, a drop in the rankings from eight down to 18 is mostly because Arizona is not uh, near the top 25. So it's a little bit of a tough loss and losing one to zero, having no points on the board. but. Arizona and uh, USC had the same amount of shots in that game. It's just one of Arizona's ended up going in, and it's it was missed opportunities, like you said. Uh, something to look past it in the season is that UCLA is ranked number one in the country. So matchups against UCLA, even if it's not necessarily a win, if they can keep it close, that could be something to solidify them as maybe even a top 10 team in the country. Yep. Definitely. First of all, you got me craving pizza now after that <laughs> analogy. But also, yeah, I think the biggest thing, if the USC wants to solidify themselves as a top 25 team, they got to take care of business against the teams they should be. Like, you can't be dropping the teams like Arizona. I think they got a game at Cal this weekend. Like, Cal's not ranked. They got to take care of those teams. Obviously, UCLA is number one. That's going to be a really tough game. But USC can still be a very good team, even if they don't beat UCLA. But you got to take care of the games you should win. Um, I think what's important and the reason why part of the reason why they lost, part of the reason why they've struggled, is playing against teams in low blocks. Teams will sit back and prevent USC from creating free flowing chances, and you genuinely just have to keep going. Mm -hmm. um, USC continues to create chances, and you know if you're not creating chances, you're not scoring goals. Um, and so they're like Kayla Colbert. She's she just got there. She's had five goals and assi five goals or assists in the four games she's played. She's only started two games. She probably needs to get into the game more. Um, and Croy Bethune, we talked about her a little. She is one of the best players in the country, full stop. And so, you know, you, you rely on your playmakers, you rely on your, your players to make chances, and that is how you take home wins, that's how you score goals, that's how you win games. After losing to Arizona, Croy Bethune came back and had two goals against Arizona State. So, good players respond. Yeah, so, um, last Saturday, the number five USC men's water polo team defeated the number 15 seat uh, San Jose State Spartans in dominant fashion, 18 to seven. This was USC's ninth consecutive victory at home. In their 18 to seven victory, the team got goals from 11 different scores with three of those players picking up hat tricks. The team was tied two all early in the game when Massimo DiMartiri scored twice and assisted once to put the Trojans up five two at the end of the first quarter. From that point forward, the Trojans didn't look back, scoring five goals in the second and third and added another three in the fourth for good measure. Kyle McKenney and Blake Jackson in goal made at least four saves to hold the Spartans to seven goals. The Trojans take on number two Berkeley on Saturday at 1 p.m. in Berkeley, California. This team hopes to avenge an 11-10 loss the last time they faced the Golden Bears, and it will be a tough matchup for the Trojans. But if they can can carry their momentum from last Saturday's game, they can wrap up their trip to Berkeley with a win. While USC fall sports are in full swing, the MLB postseason is just getting underway, with the Dodgers getting set for the second game of their playoff run later today. Today at Dodger Stadium, the Dodgers look to take a two games to none lead over the San Diego Padres in the NLDS. Last night, Los Angeles opened up the series with a 5-3 win in front of an energetic but wet sold out crowd. Shortstop Trey Turner led the way for the Dodgers, going 2 for 4 with a home run. Catcher Will Smith also had a two hit night, including an RBI double. Meanwhile, National League ERA leader Julio Urias went five innings to pick up the win, and LA's bullpen pitched four scoreless frames to close it out. With Game 2 later today, Clayton Kershaw is set to make his first postseason start in front of fan, his first postseason start since the 2020 World Series. I'm curious, what do you all expect to see from Kershaw today, given that he's pitching in front of fans in the postseason for the first time since 2019? Obviously, prior to 2020, he struggled a lot in the postseason. 2020 was really good, but that was in the bubble, which was very different. So what do you guys expect to see from Kershaw? I like Kershaw. I really like Kershaw. I mean, the way he's pitched, his curveball, it's incredible. And so what you have to think about is whether or not he's going to keep it up in front of the fans. And we said that 2020 was an aberration. But Kershaw has been great this year. It's been another great year. He's had like a 2.28 ERA, something that, you know, not many pitchers his age can really claim to say. And I think 
him being the number two guy, not being necessarily the number one guy, makes it easier for him. And hopefully, theoretically, there's less pressure on him to get the win. Um, we know this Dodgers offense will pick up any slack because they've just been that good this year. I agree. And I think the big key there is he's not being relied on as the number one guy right now. I mean, having Julio Urias and then Clayton Kershaw is kind of like a one-two punch. But with him not being the number one guy, it kind of takes – maybe forces him to kind of take a step back and just – not think so much and put so much pressure on himself. I mean, this is the guy who came close, came close to retiring in March and is now pitching game two of the NLDS. Like, I think he knows himself and knows what to do well enough um, to help get the help the Dodgers get the win. I agree. I think that uh, having already having the one game lead in the series when Kershaw comes in to maybe not be as overwhelmed by the fans is really big for him. And I also think that the Dodgers are the best team in the MLB. I think they're going to, I think they're the World Series favorite right now. And I think that the, the Padres are going to be a tough matchup, but I wouldn't expect them to put too much pressure on the Dodgers in this series. Yeah, you mentioned pressure. Obviously, all the pressure is on the Padres right now. You don't want to fall down 0-2. At the same time, if the Dodgers lose tonight and the Padres take a 1-0 lead, all of a sudden you got to go back to San Diego for games 3 and 4 with the risk that you got to win one there just to get back home. So the pressure is definitely on the Padres right now, but if the Dodgers lose tonight, it could switch very quickly. Well, Freddie Freeman said it. The Padres are hot in October, but the Dodgers have been hot all season. I mean, you don't win 111 games <laughs> and be considered a bad team. Uh, well, it's been yet another crazy week of sports here at USC, and I'm sure we have many more to come. From everyone here at Annenberg Media, this is Sports Scene. We'll see you next time.